Okay, so good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the second edition of Forests and Their People. I'm Ritika, and this year we want to kick things off with spotlighting a heritage system of Goa, Kazans. So Kazans are an agro-aqua ecological system uh, which has been engineered by indigenous communities at least 3,500 years ago. But why spotlight something that isn't te the textbook definition of uh, natural? Um, because Kazans have been reclaimed from the sea and the rivers, um, so by people, and, and they aren't really forests. The purpose of this series is to look at how ecosystems and people interact. Uh, not only do Kazans have important socio-cultural uh, significance, being a source of Goa's sheep curry, ani nuste, fish curry rice, but they could hold important solutions to climate change impacts such as food insecurity, flooding, uh, and sea level rise. And just like mole, Kazans are slowly disappearing from Goa's landscape, or rather Goa's floodplains, uh, being replaced with infrastructure um, like buildings and real estate. So today we have with us Elsa Fernandez, a person of many talents and someone I've had the privilege of interacting with over the last six months. Um, Elsa is an environmental architect. Uh, she is the founding member of uh, the Kazan Society of Goa. Uh, she is a uh, convener of her uh, village development committee and her biodiversity management committee uh, of Santa Cruz. She is a member of Goa State Biodiversity Board's Green Skilling Committee, a wetland mitra of Bonneville Lake, the list goes on. Elsa will take us through the what, why, how, maybe who and when of Kazans and how they are a real world model for human coexistence with nature. Just a few housekeeping rules. Uh, we will open up the floor to questions in the last 10, 15 minutes. So please type anything, any, anything you'd like to ask Elsa in the chat box and I will happily ask them for you uh, and make, make sure that you're muted. Um, yeah, with that, I'd like to invite Elsa to take, take charge of this session now. Thank you. Thank you, Ritika, for that intro. And uh, I would like to say hi to everybody. Am I audible? Yes, absolutely. Uh, yeah. Okay, uh, it's been a lovely day. I'll uh, share my screen so that we get on with the task we have. Uh, is it visible? Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, so, yeah. Sorry. Sorry. Saluni was in Bombay for pandemic. She joined IIT, and then. I'm sorry about that. Uh, one of our participants had muted their, um, themselves. Elsa, can you unmute, please? I've muted you by yes. mistake. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Okay. So we are going to look at a topic which probably most of us are already aware of. So this might just be a refresher to most of you. But all the same, I want to do it because the topic needs the attention that it deserves. So we are, I'm going to talk about Goa Kazans to you. They are heritage ecosystems, but which are in peril right now. Uh, in this slide, I just want to call attention of everybody to what we have around us. The basic three things. On land, we have land and water. And above the surface, we have air. These are the three things we all require to live, including the animals and any other species on earth. The water and the land on the ground made all life happen. Because 
there are very, very eco-sensitive and eco-fragile areas on the planet where water and land interact. And these areas are known as coastal areas. These coastal areas are very important for the planet because these are the areas where life emerged. And I can go to the extent of saying that I am there today in this world because water and land interacted. So on that note, I'll take you further. So when in, in all of these interactions, species came about, I came about, and when humans came about, they tried to intrude into the natural balance, the natural balance of water, food, and air, because they required food to eat, water to drink, and air to breathe. And in that little graph there, the extent. So when human habitation happened across the planet, we tried to balance ourselves out into these environmental cycles, the cycle of water, food, and air. And when we balanced ourselves out, we pushed, we nudged, we disturbed some of this. And if we did not disturb them enough, they accommodated us. But if we disturbed them more than enough, then we were wiped out. And history has records of civilizations wiped out for disturbance, which the balance could not take. So that is another point that I want to put across to all of you. So there was this little girl who lived in a village, in a village where the food for her came from the fields. A little money maybe came from the commercial crops of salt from the pans, salt pans around her village. The fruits came for her from the, from the fields, from the, from the land the houses and the areas, the place where she lived in and the activities around her came for her from the communities which lived in these situations. Probably as she was growing, she did not know what are cousins, but that was the system in which she was growing. A system which provided for her a socio, cultural, economic, environmental, and an educational connect, a system which was balanced by a community of Goa with the environment, with all the cycles, all the webs that I just spoke to you about. And because they balanced themselves with those cycles, they existed over a period of time till today. Otherwise, they would have been wiped out. And we are all aware of this. I'm sure this little girl's growth must have been part of all of your growth as well. I'm sure you heard about the cousins. I'm sure you heard or you've had the fish from the rivers. I'm sure you've had the salt from Goa. I'm sure you had the rice from the cousins. And if you have not, maybe there are enough opportunities even today to be part of these systems. Maybe they are in peril, but they are there around us to, to, be, to be seen and to be value added to in whatever we, way we can today. Because if we don't do that, then we have a huge debt on ourselves, a debt that we grew up with. I walked my village roads. I played on my village grounds. I schooled in my village school. I had fruits and air from my village trees. I had water, I had food. I lived in the cousins and in all the environment that I'm in. And I have a debt to pay back. 
and that we all have to pay before we call it a day on this planet because we all are visitors at the end of it. And if we realize this motivation, then this is what we have to give back in whatever way we can, maybe not for cousins, maybe not for forest, but surely give back to the land on which we live today. A little timeline. Remember most of this what I'm presenting uh, is also part of my secondary research. So therefore there are indications of all the references in my slides because I'm sure there is a lot to read about all of that that we all know we can share and we can read. So um, there are many um, respectable um, authors of, of a lot of research, um, Sangeeta Sonak, Nand Kumar Kamad, Father Vizita Kaun. So there are a lot of people who have written about cousins before. Some of this I'm presenting you from their research. Of course, partly I have added to a little bit of this, maybe later in the slide. So the timeline, and we all know the timeline um, um, breaks from BCE to CE. So if you see, I'll just get my pointer here. So there is a timeline which shows us 8,000 BC when people shifted from food gathering to food growing. And when this happened, cousins emerged. Maybe there are no records of this, but surely cousins emerged in this period. The records tell us that in 600 C, there is a record of the earliest cousin word uh, in the name of the Bhoja king who had a land donation. And this is the record that we can vouch for. But surely to reach this stage, these systems have been built and they were built over thousands of years. So we can kind of consider this as the starting point and it grew, grew, grew from here till present day that we have a system which survived so many years has to be part of the environmental balance. Otherwise the environment would have wiped it out. So what are they? Cousin systems. Typically we have, we have driven past these areas. Maybe these are refreshers. So maybe the next time you drive past these areas, you could, um, you could relate to them better. You must have passed around a bund, a creek, and surely that is where the whole system starts. So the lowest point in your village would be where the water body is. And around that water body, the communities thought we could reclaim the land for food. And therefore, they manually created a bund, a dike which was safeguarding the internal land from this water body from inundation. And that is how land was reclaimed for food growing. So typically there would be a water body, which is an external water body, either the river or the tributary or the creek along which there would be a bund, which today we know we can categorize as an outer bund. Beyond the outer bund on the internal side of the village, there would be, of course, a sluice gate on the bund to regulate the water. Along the sluice gates on the internal side, there would be the internal water body, which we all know locally as point. Along the point, maybe secondary bunds, and then the, the growing land, the land which would give us either salt or agriculture, vegetables, fruits, okay? So these components are the basic components of cousin ecosystem. All of them together make the cousin system. So typically I've produced a small little satellite image for you. 
a Google image where I have kind of circled them out. So if I have this creek here, along the creek, I have a bund so that I have safeguarded all of this area. Along the bund, I created a manos, which is the sluice gate. So therefore, internally, there would be a water body to drain out all of this land through this point, through the sluice gate, out into the creek and the rest of the land would be dried out. So these were contoured lands which were hydro-engineered by our ancestors. This was all manual labor, which they experientially learned and executed. This comprise of our cousin systems. And these are typically there across most of the villages in Goa. So Goa, the land characteristic, there are so many things we can learn about Goa. I've just produced a few of the land characteristics. The east are the highlands, the west is the low coast. So typically the agricultural ratio is seen more on the west coast and therefore the cousins too. If you see the Talukas, which have a high agricultural ratio as per the census, are these green and the max is in Tiswadi. Tiswadi, which is part of North Goa. That's the land use as per the NRSC. And the hydrological data shows numerous rivers which exit into the Arabian Sea from the east to the west. Tiswadi is hit by two of the major rivers the Mandavi on the north and the Zuari on the south. I'll get into Tiswadi a little more because I have done a little bit of detailed research on Tiswadi uh, for various reasons. I'll put across those reasons also to you. So this is the map which is available in the, in the state action plan for climate change for Goa. And the map is uh, a, a, a map which shows an altitude of land, which means that what is the level of the land from the sea level? And uh, it shows on the scale of blue to red, more of red spots within Tiswadi. Okay, so this is the reason why it, it attracted my attention. And if you see, there is also enough in Perne, Bardes and Salset. Most of the talukas on the east are high, higher talukas, which are at a higher altitude. Uh, there's another map in the same uh, report, which also indicates submergence, state of submergence. That's scary, but yes, it's there in the state action plan report. Um, and I'll attract your attention to this. It says that the red indicates Goa's ghats, it is believed that Goa was limited to these regions before the advent of Khazans. So the Khazans were limited to the West and the Talukas uh, on uh, which are aligned with the coast more because of the low lying nature, the very nature of Khazans being reclaimed land. So if we consider these three Talukas to be the most vulnerable talukas, we are looking at a population which is vulnerable, which is almost 50% of the state. And the three talukas together make 20% of the state area. And therefore, it needs attention. There's another study, which actually um, have, to, um, have to be give, given credit to, because this study has been quoted in the Lok Sabha, uh, in answer to one of the questions which were raised by the MP. And this study is done by the author list is here. And they developed something called as the Coastal Vulnerability Index in which Tiswadi is shown as the highest vulnerable, second Bardes, third Salset. So again, these three talukas are highlighted in another parallel study by researchers and therefore we need to pay attention to these three talukas including the kind of investment including the kind of 
uh, effect, impact all of this will have on the population and the infrastructure. Uh, this study was done uh, with um, eight uh, variables which were considered for a data which was across a 10 year period. This study, as I said, were mentioned and, and there are many, many reportings which are com coming current, currently in the newspapers about erosion, about flooding. So the population of these three talukas, if, if, I, if I bring it to your notice, Tiswadi is the smallest taluka in North Goa, only 166 square kilometers. Then is Bardes, also again within North Goa, and then is Salsit. So together they make about 700 square kilometers, a population of half of Goa as per the census. The growth rate of these three talukas also is significantly high within urban and it's negative in the rural areas of these taluka. It requires attention. And this is how our demography is. All of this finally gets into how we govern ourselves. And India is supposed to have a very young demographic dividend. And the young demographic dividend have been elect electing a quite a experienced age group of 45 to 65. And we look forward for something good to come out of this. Maybe otherwise the, the system might not work. So the population of Tiswadi, since I want to show you a little more of the cousin ecosystems of Tiswadi being uh, the lowest uh, in elevation and therefore uh, having the highest cousin. So these are the urban lines villages of uh, Tiswadi. They all are in the high population bracket within all the decades. And the villages, the rurals are in the very low population bracket. And in fact, it's dipping. The population is becoming less in our villages and more in the urban areas. The villages across Tiswadi is uh, our average a 10 square kilometer in the map here, you can make out the scale on which I have put them. The smallest villages are the blue and the largest are the red, Shurao and Kurka. Coming to the cousins, the draft CZMP provided us some data on the cousin areas. Of course, across Goa, it is estimated that the cousin lands are around 18,500 hectares. But the CZMP also gave us, the draft gave us numbers. And the numbers show Tiswadi almost 100 square kilometers. Bardes, another 41. And Salseth, another 46. So you can see how the highest extent of Khazan is there in Tiswadi. And it kind of corroborates with the data that Tiswadi is the lowest in elevation. And, and therefore the principle, basic principle of cousins were reclaimed land. A little bit of data on its agriculture. It's, it has about 86, which is about 50% of the Taluka area is cultivable. And cousins are a little more than that because remember cousins are also marshes marshlands so therefore cousins have to be higher than the agricultural and they are to the extent of 100 so all of this i'm going to kind of put it across to you in the form of some analysis which i have done in qgis we can work out the digital elevation of any land and therefore since it struck me that Tiswadi is within five, five meters of elevation as per the state action plan. That five meters of elevation can even be one meter, can even be two meters. And therefore I needed to take this a little further to understand what could be the actual situation for Tiswadi. And uh, here is two analysis uh, uh, which are uh, allowed in QGIS. It's called aspect analysis and hillshade analysis. And you can see a central portion of Tiswadi, which is here, which is clearly highlands. 
and all of these villages which are uh, marked with their own boundaries 20 of them a little portion highland here in shurao a little in divar and the rest of it it is visibly flat and low we don't know how low but it is visibly flat and only a few portion here are high rise if i i have done um, slope profiling in qgis also but just to corroborate uh, on the slope profiling through another program i tried to section through across and along of tiswadi and the sections brought out this kind of profile so what is high is high what is low is very low as low as 2 meters this is what is quite significant and needs attention and if you see the extent just within that line of section it's almost 50% of tiswadi area because all of this is low and flat to understand the water base of tiswadi we need to understand the hydrology the hydrology as i mentioned to you earlier two rivers which empty into the sea and across uh, tiswadi one on the north mandavi with the highest basin of 1580 square kilometers zuari around 1000 square kilometers all of them emptying at the north and the southern point of tiswadi that is quite significant because if land is low it could be vulnerable to water and if i digitize all of the hydrology data remember all of the data is available on the nrsc national remote sensing site called bhuvan which has been uploaded by isro and therefore this is authentic data which which any public can download and work on and i'm sure whoever is interested can even take all of this further for our little state of goa so you can see the kind of network of hydrology which are intruding into each of our villages and i'm sure you are all aware of all these creeks and tributaries and streams around in your villages so uh, and you see how well they gel with the highlands the highlands drain into these streams into Ansa? the tributaries yeah uh, your uh, screen has stopped sharing okay just a minute has it come on again yes okay so you see how these streams they drain the highlands into these networks and into the river okay so it's it's kind of a great um, artwork it's kind of a poetry which has which has happened on the land land and water uh looking at a few variables which are connected with water one of them is the tidal variations there is a tidal variations of about 2 and 1/2 meters which could hit uh tiswadi and this is a place called goa valley remember tidal variations are place specific time specific okay so i had to look at one of the locations within tiswadi and i got a range of about 2 and 1/2 meters if you see the map of india of uh, the west coast is on the higher tidal variation range of the country uh i've drawn a typical section through um, through our land and typically if we have high land it would be at the at the lower level it we would have settlements and then it would dip into the fields and it would probably dip into the internal water bodies which are points and along the bunds or the sluice gate and into the external water body which would then be the boundary between two villages typically these would be the scene and if this is the scene if i section through this and show the 2 and 1/2 meter of tidal rise 
if i add to it just another parameter of a heavy daily rainfall and a sea level rise component then i am almost hitting a 3 meter immediately considering 3 meters of water level rise possibility if most of these events happen at the same time and let's rule out the lower 1 meter uh, assuming there are some salt marshes around so maybe that might not affect so let's look at the top 2 meters of land and this is what my study took me into i tried to identify the 2 meter contour of tiswadi land uh, which can possibly get affected if there is a sea level rise and this is the extent there is a lot of research in the background of this of which i'll not be in a position to discuss but this is the outcome of the 2 meter identification lands which are across various villages which have been identified in terms of square meters a uh, square kilometers and i have the list over here and inundated below 2 meters land to the extent of 72 square kilometers which is almost 43% of tiswadi area in total and 73% of the khazans because these lands then i try to verify where they are on the satellite uh the satellite imagery i will show you in the next slide before that i'll just put across this khazan systems to you the khazan systems have these bunds across all of these water bodies internal external sluice gates so therefore if i assume that the system was not there then i can fairly say that okay we are we are vulnerable to sea level rise and we are vulnerable to flood risk and this is the extent that it would flood but i know today that we had a system which has been gifted to us by our ancestors and this system already has equipped us as defense against a sea level rise which is an impact of the climate change now let this led me to understand what is the status of this system and i went across tiswadi and to tell you the figures of tiswadi tiswadi has 91 notified bunds i have put the numbers across village wise 77% of them are in bad condition tiswadi has 190 sluice gates which we know as manos 50% of them are showing evident destructions either parts are missing or they are leaking or they are not taken care of not maintained at all and like this i have a lot of data regarding the other components as well but these two components uh, are significant to be mentioned this is the status of goa across these talukas we have almost 488 notified outer bunds they are notified by the government of goa three talukas you can significantly see that each of them have a range of almost 100 bunds and therefore you can see that these are the reasons why they are vulnerable and in fact within the khazan ecosystems we have inherited the solution to this risk as well and if we kind of on a very 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 conservative scale try to put a price tag on that it could if i if i if i consider 500 kilometers being the bunds across goa just at a scale of 1 kilometer per bund and a 10 crore value for each bund that is including the point including the sluice gate including the bund which is a very very conservative scale because we are not in a position to even create this infrastructure today easily the value goes to about 5000 crores but all of this is getting deteriorated and destroyed which could actually be our need of the future this is a close up of some of the villages i would like to show to you 
uh, some Atayesh, you must have uh, come across a lot of uh, these videos which get uh, circulated during the monsoon season, and I'm sure in the coming monsoon also. So you can see the, the tributary, the water bodies intruding into our villages like this as creeks or as points. And these are the lands which are cousins, which are having a risk of inundation. Some Atayesh, a risk of 77%. Karambolim, a risk of 73%. Remember that when I show this figure to you, it is part of my research, but really actually, on the ground, 30 to 40 percent of it is already inundated. It's already inundated, and only the farmers are talking about it because right now only they are affected. If there was a building out here in Karambolim of the government, then probably that would have been highlighted. If there was a road out here, probably that video would have come on WhatsApp. But there is only a farmer out here, and there is no highlight. There is, no, uh, there is no attention given to his plight. And 30 to 40% of this land of the farmer is already underwater. This is closer to the city, Panaji, and we have uh, part of the cousins of Merse's village, which is Morombio Pikeno, which has been acquired by a, a township by the EDC. We have, we have the uh, Pato, um, uh, Pato Panaji buildings out here, okay? I'll go to that slide in a while later. So we have even mayor says, and I, I'm highlighting this because a lot of government projects have been lined up in this area, including the district court building, which is coming up right now, and a lot of acquisitions which are coming up uh, in the pipeline. So I developed a kind of a defense matrix, which, which kind of categorized the villages of Tiswadi on their vulnerability scale and them in a risk, risky and urgent score, okay? Uh, which are shown as red and the greens uh, scale. So this is how it is across in our villages. Maybe all of this is not in the public domain, but the poor farmer across in all cousins is suffering. And our agriculture or our food cycle is affected. There is another component which I want to draw your attention to. Some of the buns which are being taken up by the government, especially that if we have 500 buns in Goa, and we look at all of these 500 buns as concretized tomorrow, uh, I think uh, we, uh, that is a very unsustainable condition. I can show these places which are concretized where the land and the water interaction, which I mentioned to you in the first slide has been disconnected and pollution is setting in. Everywhere that I came across concretized buns, I have clearly seen pollution setting in. And this is the state of our buns, which our ancestors skillfully made. And even today, there are villages who patiently do this work. And I would rather want the government to identify these workers, empanel them, and skill them and put them across Goa for the rest of these systems which need their attention. Instead of just merely taking a Goa schedule rates um, of, of, uh, of specifications and concretizing or cementing the buns. This is the state across the Swadi. And I'm sure if we go across Bardes and Salset, we also may see a similar scene. This is Pato to you, Pato buildings, which is sitting on Khazan land. And this is the possibility of inundation that we look at. So resilient cities across the world are talking about infrastructure investment into cities. 
and whether we are giving a thought to land use planning, to sea level rise, to climate change risks. These are the questions which we see a lot of report in a many newspapers across Goa, even today and across in the coming monsoon, I'm sure there will be a lot of opportunities. But are we doing enough? And these are some of the causes and these causes are already at our doorstep. We already have altered runoffs, runoffs which we have changed from a 0.2 runoff coefficient to a 0.9 runoff coefficient. Tidal rise has been affected by climate change. Heavy daily rainfall is a fallout of climate change. Our drainage infrastructure is completely ill-planned. Natural blue-green resources across in our cities and in our villages are being embanked by concrete and narrowed down instead of desilted and looked upon as natural uh, resources for our resilience towards climate change. So these are the factors, these are the causes, they need attention and they need an action plan accordingly. Land use planning is going to be a major impacting area. So what can we do? We can do individually, we can do as a community, we can look at governments to do a few things for us. Individually, we have to identify the cousins if they are the ones which are going to be the most vulnerable. Maybe we could report failures, system of cousins which is kind of collapsing because cousins had a 24 hour maintenance system, which, uh, which I have not mentioned to you earlier. But, the Kazan ecosystem had its own management, had its own governance, which, which is in peril even to, as on today. But can we look at all of this? Can we look at all of this in terms of a community? Can we look at awareness and sensitivity and education material? Can we expertise further on this? Can we expect the government to look at restoring bonds, restoring sluice gates, increasing the carrying capacity of our water bodies, but as nature-based solutions, not in terms of cement and concrete. And can we look at a better land use planning? I'll leave uh, all of you with these thoughts. Amche khazan, amche dies. Thank you. We have created a khazan society of Goa. I've given you the website link. Um, I've given you my number as well. If there's anything which I need to respond to, uh, I know the topic is vast. I, I tried to shrink it within the time given to me. Uh, I'll open it for your questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Elsa. That was uh, completely illuminating. And like you said, it's a lot of information to digest. Um, we, if our uh, participants have any questions, please uh, type them in the box for me. Um, and I will ask Elsa uh, until somebody says something. Um, Elsa, I have a question actually. I was wondering if you could explain to us uh, the dual role of mangroves in the case of Kazans. Now, uh, everybody talks about how mangroves need to be protected across various coastal cities, how they build resilience to um, erosion, flooding, uh, you know, tsunamis. But in the case of Kazans, it's a little different. I was wondering if you could speak to us a little bit more about that. Yeah, sure. Uh, you see, uh, when the communities created these bonds, uh, they were manually created. It was hard, hard work of their hands. And even today, these communities are there, and I have personally, personally witnessed these events. They actually scoop out the, the, the clay in their hands and they um, um, ram it on the bun. So you can imagine how they must have done when they started off from point zero level. So uh, when these buns were made, they needed maintenance and they realized that they were getting affected by the water bodies because these were lining the water bodies. And therefore, probably the advent of 
mangroves came in the form of protection to these buns. So if you see today, uh, buns are lined by these mangroves and they have self-sustained themselves. They self-grow themselves along the bun. But since they are also very, uh, affin very, very uh, um, in affinity with saline land and these being the reclaimed lands, if there is a breach in the bund, if there is a, a, a destroyed uh, sluice gate, then the saline water is in the, in the productive land, land which was otherwise meant for salt pans, meant for agriculture. Now the mangroves wouldn't know that they have to be limited on the bund. They would encroach wherever they would go. And therefore, over a period of time, the lands which were left inundated and not put back in the place, maintained sluice gates, buns, across over the period of years, similar to what we see in the, in the Merces village, where uh, the uh, Pato area was reclaimed for buildings, the rest of the land was just left like that. It was left inundated. And therefore, now today we see that land taken over by mangroves. So we have this concept of mangroves being encroachers in some part of Kazan, but they are also, uh, they are genuinely part of Kazans in their, in their uh, place where they are meant to be, not in all of Kazans. Because if you, if you look at mangroves in all of Kazans, then we, we can't look at cousins being productive land. We will have to look at it only from the environmental aspect. Thank you. Thanks for that explanation, Elsa. Um, we have a question here from Amrita. Um, she uh, says, how are uh, Kazans notified? I, I, I think she meant buns. Uh, how are Kazans notified by which government department and what provisions apply post being notified? So how are buns, I suppose, notified? Uh, By whom? And cousins, cousin land as such has not yet been notified, but the buns are notified. And uh, uh, most of these buns which are notified are outer buns. Remember, there are different uh, types or categories of buns across Goa. So the ones that you see internally without, within the fields are, not, are mostly not the notified buns. So the most of the notified buns are the outer buns, which surely will have an outer tributary or a creek lining it. Okay, so these notifications have been done since the liberation. I think the last notification is somewhere around 1987. Uh, and uh, these are done by the Soil Conservation Department. Actually, it was an independent department since liberation, but it has been put uh, under the Agriculture Department. So the notification data is available with that department if you want to access it. But cousin land as such may, uh, may get uh, recorded through the CZMP. That is what I look forward to. Um, yeah, I think if that has answered your question. Okay, and the, and the next part of the question is what provisions apply post being notified? So what are the benefits of notifying a bund, I suppose? Uh, notification, uh, notifying the bund, if you talk to any tenant association or a komnidad, which are the organization in charge of the maintenance at the village level, if you talk to them, they will tell you that if, if there is a breach in a bund, then they will have to go to the mamladar, through the mamladar, extreme last point being the soil conservation, because the fund of the government for maintenance in the, for these bunds, they being notified, therefore the, the onus is on the government to maintain these bunds. And the funds is, alloc is allocated to the soil conservation department. So it's a big trail from the tenant association to the soil conservation department to create a project for uh, repairing a breach by which time maybe a breach which is one meter wide ends up into a 10 meter and a 20 meter wide. And therefore um, the funds and all of these processes which are actually in place right now 
do not see the light of the day. And, and this is one of the reason why cousin systems in terms of their maintenance have been not showing good results. So the tenant associations find it very difficult to look after these notified buns themselves because their budget is as small as 5,000 rupees, which, which, with which they just take care of a little bit of erosion here and there. For every little thing, they either have to go to the Mamladar or go to the soil conservation department. So that is how the notification and the funding systems of the government work right now. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I hope that answers your question, Amrita. Uh, we don't seem to have any more questions. So I think we can close the session um, because we're almost, we're four minutes away from five. Thank you uh, so much, everyone, especially um, Elsa. Thank you so much for giving us your time. And uh, for everybody present here, please uh, do go on to the website of the Kazan uh, Society of Goa. And uh, there are ways in which you can help as well. And hopefully, we can save these ecosystems from going extinct in Goa. Thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful weekend. Thank you, everybody, for listening. And I'm sure all of you can be part of the cousin systems in one way more than uh, more than uh, all of us. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye bye.